Hello, I am Karen Bessey, the Director of Continuing Medical Provider and Nursing Education. The purpose of this video is to provide an overview of what is required for RSS coordinators in respect to documentation and accreditation. What we'll be reviewing are some of the key CME requirements, the disclosure process, as well as the process, and provide an overview and a summary. Each RSS activity will have a member of our CME team assigned to work with them, and this individual would be a resource for them as far as documentation requirements, answering any questions, providing activity codes, and whatever is needed. As an RSS coordinator, you are an extension of our team, and you are responsible to make sure and confirm that with your activity, that Norton Healthcare maintains the accreditation standards that we will be reviewing. The ACCME has five standards and there's three that are specific to the processes that we will be reviewing today. One of the key things is that all education needs to be unbiased and have no influence from commercial entities. And this is done through a disclosure form. And this form asks the individual if they have a relationship with an ineligible company. So let's define what an ineligible company is. Here is the formal definition, and this can be found on all the disclosure forms. So essentially, it is a company that sells or uses a product on a patient. And here are some examples of ineligible companies. And these are companies that must be disclosed on the disclosure form. So pharmaceutical device companies, labs that sell products, um, vitamins and distributors of foods and dietary supplements, as well as manufacturers of health-related wearable products and apps. These are examples of eligible companies, and these are companies that do not need to disclose. So for example, an individual does not need to disclose Norton Healthcare or U of L. They don't need to disclose if they were the name of their physician practice, because these um, companies are all determined eligible. If a provider or speaker is on a committee or a member of a national foundation, such as the Kennedy Foundation or any of those types of organizations, those do not need to be disclosed. The next question is who? So essentially, anyone needs to disclose foreign activity if they can influence the educational program in any way. So this would be by selecting the speakers or by content. And it can include the activity planners, the moderators, a speaker, an individual that selects cases, and in some cases if there's a content reviewer. For an RSS, all activities do require disclosures there is one exception. If the discussion is on non-clinical topics, such as maybe legislation, wellness, how to do research, um, any of those you do not need a disclosure form. In some cases, you may have scheduled speakers and you may have a session on um, resilience. That would be an activity that you do not need the disclosure form from the speaker. Um, so a lot of it depends on what your topics are, and again, this is the only exception. And if you are unsure, just reach out to the CME team member and they can help you um, navigate that. This is essentially what a disclosure form will look like, and we provide this to you, and it is also available as a resource. So what do individuals need to disclose? 
Well, there is a time period and it's anything within the last two years. Now, within those last two years, if they did do a one-time activity or speaking and they are no longer doing it, they still need to disclose it. And then the form has an area where they can indicate it has ended. It's for the individual only. Previously, you had to indicate if your spouse or partner had relevant relationships, but with the new guidelines, it's for the individual only. Also, it is all relationships with companies, and it does not matter if it's related to the topic or not. So if they do have a relationship with a com an eligible company, they do indicate it. The form does ask what product or service, and then that helps us to review it to determine if it is relevant to the topic. If an individual is involved in research and they're receiving funds for that, that does need to be disclosed. And now it's, um, they do disclose it if the funds go to the employer or another organization. Disclosure forms need to be completed and updated on an annual basis. And additionally, if they have any changes, it should be updated then. So the process, so we've tried to outline a streamlined process for RSS coordinators. And we did look at best practices at other organizations that have a lot of regularly scheduled series. One of the things is once you do obtain the disclosure, we ask that you review it. Now, the timing of the disclosure is it needs to be obtained prior to the activity or prior to the planning of the activity. And the purpose of this is when you review it, if they did indicate a relevant relationship, this needs to be reviewed before they're either speaking or before they're selecting speakers or topics if they're a planner. So if there is a yes there when you're reviewing it, contact your CME coordinator. And then we will work with you to mitigate the relationship and this would be done with CME. Um, so again, anytime there's a yes, forward the form to us prior to the event. Once you receive the forms, we have a Excel form, which is a grid, if you can complete this. There needs to only be one grid per activity. Um, again, only one form per speaker if they're involved in multiple um, sessions throughout the year. Um, so essentially you will have a entry for each individual that participates in the activity. We ask that you forward the grid to us at either quarterly or every six months. And again, Disclosure should be reviewed and updated annually or if there's a change. We ask that you save the disclosures um, electronically, uh, one disclosure per file. And when you save those, if you can save them by last name and then first name. With these saved disclosures, if you can forward those to us either quarterly or every six months. Now, once we get that information, there are requirements on what needs to be disclosed to learners prior to the activity. And this is if the planner speaker relationships, and this includes if there is a relationship and if there is not a relationship, and we do provide templates for you. Here is an example of planners and speakers that have no relationships. Here is an example of a slide that a speaker or multiple speakers did have relevant relationships. There are four requirements that must be displayed or the learner must be notified of. That's the name of the speaker, the name of the company that they have the relationship with, the type of relationship. So this could be speaker, honorarium, consultant, research. 
And then it does need to include that successful mitigation of the relationship has been completed. A lot of times speakers do have disclosure slides within their presentation when they're starting out. This does not meet the uh, standards and the guidelines in that speakers typically do not indicate the fourth requirement, which is successful mitigation of the relationship. So we cannot rely on that as far as the notification to learners that meets accreditation guidelines. Um, we do provide a template for you. Another item that must be displayed to learners prior to the activity is the accreditation and designation statements. Again, we provide a template for you. There is a direct accreditation as well as joint. And we do have a few RSSs that are jointly provided and you um, are aware of those. Um, but for the most part, it's direct. So it would just be Norton Healthcare rather than a joint statement. Both templates are available. We ask that you not edit the statement the only thing you would edit is the number of hours. So if your activity is two hours or half an hour, please um, update it with the correct um, amount of CME provided. Um, you can notify learners of, with the accreditation designation on an email invite also, or if you're creating a flyer or marketing info to promote your activity. If you are doing a flyer or marketing, um, we ask that you send it to our office for approval prior to distribution. And also we ask that you save communication um, for that in that we do, um, if this activity is audited, we would need to demonstrate um, that we did show accreditation designation statements. Um, so please save those. And we also ask that you send those to your CME coordinator every now and then so we can confirm that these are also um, relayed properly. Attendance for RSSs is 100% automated, which, you know, there's many advantages to the attendee. They get attendance in real time. Um, if you decide that you want a roster, that is fine. Um, we do not need the roster, and that is not how we will um, provide credit. Again, we provide RSS um, activity coordinators with a code unique to each date of activity, and we ask that you use this um, with your attendees for them to claim attendance. The code we provide to you is valid for 14 days. And again, we will provide you a template. Here is a screenshot of what it looks like when an individual um, does go in. Um, so they would scan the barcode, the QR code, enter their email address associated with their account that they created, enter the code, and then their attendance is recorded. We do provide the templates and all of this information to you online. You can go to our website, nortoncme.com, and this is what the site will look like at the top corner. The first option is CME Home. And then once you select that, you would select helpful links and resources. And then once there, this is what your page would look like. And here is where the resources and forms are located. So all of the information is there as well as the templates. Additionally, we have resources for your attendees. So if you have new providers and they need to um, do create an account with us, there is a tip sheet on how to create an account at nortoncme.com. There's also a template or directions for how attendees can claim credit with an activity. We do ask when you're there, um, if you have not already done, please check your listing. With your information, we enter it into our system and then it is published. And this is on the internet, so anyone interested does have access to it to attend your activity. Um, so we do ask that you confirm if there is a location listed that that's accurate. 
Um, also, if you want to confirm the coordinator's name, and then if you have any updates, that can be sent to our office. So in summary, uh, pre-activity, speaker and planner disclosures, completing the grid, um, any relevant relationships, again, contact our office and we'll work to mitigate them prior to the activity. And then also you have the option to do any email marketing and including the accreditation designation statements. At the activity, we ask that you display the accreditation designation statement. We ask that you display the speaker and planner relationship status if there are no relationships, as well as if there are, and we ask that you provide the attendance code. Following the activity, we ask that you um, send us a disclosure grid and then also the disclosures. And again, this only needs to be done quarterly or every six months. Forms and everything you need is at NortonCME.com. And this is not on inside, it's on the internet. And if you have any questions, always feel free to contact our office or your coordinator. Here is our email. If your RSS activity does have exhibitors or commercial support, there's another short video for you to watch on that. So then that way you can make sure you're maintaining the accreditation guidelines for that. Again, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to working with you and providing quality education to our providers.